Welcome to the Institute of Catholic Culture, a nonprofit Catholic organization dedicated to the re-evangelization of our society through educational and cultural programs offered to the public at no charge. This and other presentations, hundreds of hours of audio, are available for free on our website, www.instituteofcatholicculture.org. There you can listen to or download educational programs related to all aspects of our divine faith, and you can review our schedule of upcoming events. We hope you can join us in person. The handout reference during this presentation is available for download on the audio section of our website. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. O Master who loves mankind, illuminate our hearts with the pure light of your divine knowledge, and open the eyes of our mind to understand the teachings of your holy scriptures. Instill in us also the fear of your blessed commandments, and that we may overcome all carnal desires, entering upon a spiritual life and understanding and acting in all things according to your holy will. For you are the enlightenment of our souls and bodies, O Christ God, and to you we give glory together with your eternal Father and your all holy gracious and life and spirit, both now and ever and unto ages of ages. Amen. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. All right, great. Uh, a real joy to be back with all of you. Thank you for, for returning. And... I really wanted to pick up where we left off because uh, I tried rushing to make a few comments and tie points together, but I think I just wanted to slow down just a little bit and go back to what we were drawing and explain it a little bit more. And I wanted to go into reading the scriptures as to what did Moses look like after he entered the true presence of God when, when heaven and earth were joined on top of Mount Sinai. He went up twice. We know the second, uh, the first time he comes down, God hadn't finished really with everything. He has to send him back because the golden calf, while God's giving the instructions of how to build the tabernacle, the tent of meeting that we find here that in this construction, while God's giving the plans is when the golden calf breaks out, and Moses goes down and breaks the Ten Commandments. A lot of bad things happen, but um, we get a good picture of what God was trying to accomplish when Moses entered the cloud. If we'll take a look at uh, Exodus chapter 34. So what I wanted to do is go back to pointing to the drawing and what we were saying, and then showing how I was mapping out that this is really a reflection of Eden. So I went, before I go into Moses and what he looked like, I just wanted to review some of that with you. And then we'll be able to see uh, that the very Mount Sinai setup itself is set up in the tabernacle. The tabernacle is a reflection of Mount Sinai. It's the very image of Mount Sinai. I like the way I've, I've read uh, recently the John Bergsma and Brant Petrie, which I would highly recommend to everybody, uh, their introduction to Catholic scripture, the Old Testament, uh, Ignatius Press sells it. And so if you, if you don't have a copy of it, it's about a thousand pages and it's worth every cent of it. It is a fantastic book on the Old Testament. Again, that's the John Bergsma and Brant Petrie introduction to Holy Scripture, Sacred Scripture, the Old Testament. And, and in there, they have excellent charts and maps of that, of what I'm describing here in terms of how, I think it's on pages 183 and 187. There's some really great charts. I, I use, I've used that book for three years in a row now here at Christum when I do Old Testament. And so I'd highly recommend it. And uh, so if I say some things too quickly about this, I'll, I'll try to answer some questions. I'll try to slow down. But I really want to recommend their book will point out some things that are very much so complementary to what I'm saying here tonight. So, so let me show on the board again. The first one I put up here is I drew again what's happening at Exodus chapter 19. I drew Mount Sinai. So I'm looking at Exodus chapter 19. And so I drew a mountain. And on the top of the mountain, I drew the glory cloud, which is representative of heaven coming down, the transcendent heaven coming down and manifesting itself on top of Mount Sinai. And then Moses said, the Lord told Moses in Exodus chapter 19, it was at verse 12, he says, put a border around the mountain so that nobody crosses the border and comes up. And so the reason the Lord says this is if the glory cloud is coming down and touching the top of the mountain, whatever God's holiness touches becomes holy. Holiness is understood as communicable, and that's why you'll see even in the book of Numbers, uh, Gary Anderson writes about this and talks about this as well. He mentions it. It's not in his Genesis of Perfection, but
but it was a talk I was recently listening to that really highlighted that aspect. When you look at the opening chapters of Numbers, particularly chapters two through four, that deal with moving the furniture that's inside the temple, which the, the tent temple, which is called the tabernacle, since the glory cloud at the end of Exodus, the last chapter comes down and fills the tabernacle, it's just like Mount Sinai. When Mount Sinai was touched, Mount Sinai becomes holy. It became a sanctuary. And so sanctuaries have borders because they're gardens. They're sanctuary gardens. They're holy. They're dedicated to the holiness of, of a God. And in this case, the only God, the one true God, contrary to all the false gods of Egypt. And so the borders put around there in Exodus 19, 12. And this is where he says, no one is to cross it. Don't even touch it, lest you die. And we know in ancient Egypt, they used curses at sanctuaries. And so threatening death is certainly a curse that if you cross this border, you will die. You'll lose your life. This is a very clear reminder that it's a holy place. And you never enter a holy place without proper ritual washings. And that explains why Moses communicated, wash your clothes, do not touch a woman. All of these are related to recognizing you're entering into a world separate from the ordinary world. And especially if God has touched it, it's now holy. Just like even the furnishings, when you read it in Numbers chapter two through four, they had to be wrapped by the priest before the other Levite family clans could even move it. They weren't even allowed to touch it because it was so holy. Even though they were Levites, they belonged to another family, not in the direct line of Aaron. And so just because the glory cloud had touched these furnishings and this idea of holiness being communicable, they couldn't even touch it. So similar to we have relics. Relics are holy because the spirit of God indwelled the person in such a powerful way that it made these physical relics holy. And so they were seen in some way as communicating holiness. So I've drawn this again, and I was trying to go through the main point of the study is we read in the Catechism of the Catholic Church, number 52, that God's plan was always to make us sons in the Son, capital S, sons in the Son, to enter into the relationship that the eternal word has always had with the Father, because no one knows the Father but the Son and anyone to whom the Son reveals him. And so I talked about this in terms of being deification. I pointed to paragraph number 460 in the Catechism of the Catholic Church. And I said, how can we, how are we going to get into the mind of understanding what Moses meant that on the seventh day God rested, since we accept substantial mosaic authorship? I wanted to show you, if we look at Mount Sinai, it'll give us insights into understanding the Garden of Eden. And so I've drawn down here at this first border that goes around the mountain that no one can cross, lest not even touch it, lest you die. I also drew up here, I hope it's uh, legible, I wrote Exodus 24, 16, because this is where the Lord calls to Moses on the seventh day, and on the seventh day, Moses enters God's rest. So you have to remember, in Moses' mind, the seventh day is when a human, for the, for the first time in recorded history, since the flood and the prehistory before the flood, the first time a human participates in God's divinity is on the seventh day. So if that's what the seventh day meant to Moses, and we know that in some ways that these sanctuaries, these sanctuaries themselves um, are replicated in temples, it begins to tell us a little bit about what what Moses was trying to tell us about the creation of the world. So what I want to go into is saying, when Moses went into this glory cloud of God, referring back to paragraph 460 of the Catechism of the Catholic Church, what did Moses look like? What did Moses experience? Because he's standing where heaven and earth are joined, and the only reason he's allowed in is he has gone through ritual washing, showing a cleansing. He's accepted the word of God. In Exodus chapter 20, we get the Ten Commandments. So what has he done with his human will? In making a sacrifice in Exodus 24, he's pledging himself, and all the people pledge themselves to keep God's word, 
to keep his commandments. So they're living off of the word of God. They've let the word of God enter them and they're surrendering to it. So their human will is being taken up to share in God's will. They're being cleansed. And then through this spiritual cleansing, he's eventually asked on the seventh day to enter into where heaven and earth are joined. In other words, on the top of the mountain, what we're seeing is the true presence, the true presence of God on earth. And yes, it's all symbolic of what? Holy communion, how Jesus is going to become the true temple. Jesus is the true tabernacle, and he's going to bring us into participating in the divine nature. Uh, the entrance way to being permitted to participate is baptism, and he's going to communicate his divinity now to us through Holy Communion, through what looks like bread and what looks like wine, but are the true body and blood of Christ, the true presence of God. Look at Exodus 34, what Moses looked like when he comes back down the mountain after having participated in the true presence. So Exodus chapter 34, I'm starting at verse 29. It says, when Moses came down from Mount Sinai with the two tables of the covenant in his hand, as he came down from the mountain, Moses did not know that the skin of his face shone because he had been talking with God. And when Aaron and all the sons of Israel saw Moses, behold, the skin of his face shone, and they were afraid to come near him. But Moses called to them, and Aaron and all the leaders of the congregation returned to him. What, what do they mean? It, they returned to him. Light was coming out of him, the divine light of God. The divine light that came out of Jesus Christ at the transfiguration, that light is what Moses was sharing in. He had been made a participant in the divine nature because he had surrendered his will by God's grace given to him. He had surrendered his will to God, and he continued in that surrender, and God was sanctifying him and bringing him in to receive what humans were always meant to receive, to become partakers in the divine nature that their human nature would be elevated to share in the supernatural, so that while remaining distinct persons, they would be elevated into sharing an eternal life. And so they were afraid of him, because this light was coming out of him. And he had to call them back to him. And he says, well, after they came near, he gave them in commandment all that the Lord had spoken with him on Mount Sinai. So notice the Lord continues to invite the people as he makes a covenant, he brings them deeper into knowing his will and in knowing his plan so that we can gradually surrender to it. And so you notice this is the, the pedagogy of God, where he's gradually revealing himself and enabling us by this revelation, according to paragraph 52 of the Catechism, to know him and love him in a manner that exceeds their natural capacity. He's elevating us to sharing in something higher than ourselves. And so this is what Moses looked like when he came out of the cloud and from being in the divine presence. So take a look now. I'm going to draw again. I want to show you how this looks like Eden. And so this is the standing view, looking off in the distance at what Mount Sinai would look like. This was the bird's eye view. So I'm drawing the border that you see here that don't even touch it lest you die, that's the border here. And then this glory cloud would be in the center. And so what I'm showing you is a bird's eye view and you can see an outer border of a sanctuary and something very special in the middle. And what we're looking at really is Eden. Remember the tree of the knowledge of good and evil and the tree of life were at the center of the garden. So Moses tells us something a little bit about Adam. Adam was brought to life inside what would have been a holy place and sanctuary. He was already sharing in God's grace. He was already clothed in God's grace, much like you see, much like you saw Moses coming out of the mountain, radiating light because he was clothed in light. He was clothed in God's glory. He was participating in the divine nature. And so what I wanted to show here is that this is what Adam was in possession of by also receiving the Lord's commandment. What was the commandment, do not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, doing? It was providing Adam's will something to surrender to God's word, to accept God's word and to keep it so that his will was being taken, his human will was being taken into the divine will, 
and he was living off of the divine will, and therefore he's naked and not ashamed because he, in fact, is clothed. He is clothed in God's life. He is living and sharing in God's own life, but God has not yet finished the communion participation that he wanted with Adam. So in other words, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, as we were reading about it in St. Gregory Nazianzen's second oration on Easter, it is something by which um, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil represents contemplation, and it's something that God was trying to mature Adam and Eve for contemplation before he let them have access to the tree of life. In other words, to eat from the tree of life. The presence itself was already communicating something to Adam and Eve. And so I've drawn in the middle here the cloud right here. And so according, uh, Father Hezekiah just brought up St. Ephraim. And of course, in St. Ephraim, it's very clear that the tree of the knowledge of good and evil is basically the equivalent to the veil in the temple. The veil in the temple. So in other words, when the Jews constructed a temple, it was made to look like the design you see right here. The bird's eye view you see right here, how do you turn it into the experience of crossing through borders and getting into God's true presence when you construct a temple? Well, bird's eye view of the tent temple and even the temple in Jerusalem, it's a little bit more square. There are arguments for sure that it actually was as circular, just like Hagia Sophia is circular. You can also argue that the tent temple is also based on a more circular pattern in terms of Mount Sinai, but I'm going to stick with the square temple look. So in other words, I've just drawn basically an elongated rectangle as poorly as my elongation looks on the board. And so what I've drawn here is to match, in other words, Mount Sinai's bird's eye view is here. And this is really Eden. This is basically Genesis chapter 3. Um, the description of what's left for us in Genesis chapter 3, verse 24, the border that is here in Genesis 3, 24, matches the border in Exodus 19, 12. So in St. Ephraim the deacon, writing in the 4th century, St. Ephraim basically argues that the tree of the knowledge of good and evil served as a veil to the tree of life. So in his hymns of paradise, he will say this. So how do how now if you're at a worm's eye view walking into the temple, this would be the holy place. And the way you would represent the glory cloud that came down on Mount Sinai would be by hanging a curtain that you have to pass through. So when you read that the veil tore when Jesus was died on the cross, the, the veil tore, that's what the veil represents. It represents an area. So for instance, the temple is like Eden. That's why inside the temple in 1 Kings chapter 8, it's designed with palm trees. It's got lions. It's got flowers. It's got fruit trees. It's got everything like you would find in paradise. And it even has statues statues of angels, statues, uh, it has carved into the doors, cherubim, uh, because no church should not be highly decorated. No church should be missing angels and saints all over the place, because actually God's original temple was decorated with angels all over the place. So in other words, the very tent temple that Moses designs, Moses is designing a tent temple while he's standing up here in the glory cloud of God, God is giving him seven speeches on how to construct a temple. That tent temple that he constructs, so just like Moses crossed that border, do not, do not cross it, don't even touch it. God calls him to go beyond it. That's that border right here, the same border represented by Genesis 3.24. The cloud right here, the temple veil would be the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, because behind it is the Ark of the Covenant, which is God's dwelling presence, God who is life itself. So St. Ephraim argues that the tree, of, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil is like a veil. And using Gregory Nazianzen, we can see that veil was something 
that they were being forbidden to go beyond because they weren't yet ready yet to enter the true presence of God. Just like Moses did not enter the true presence of God on day one. He had to go through all sorts of covenants, ritual washings, sacrifices, a meal, an observation before God even let him come in to the glory cloud. So similarly, Moses is told to construct a tent of meeting that is that is basically reflecting what it would take to go up Mount Sinai. So just like at Mount Sinai, they had an altar and they had a washing basin. So you have a, an altar and a washing basin outside of the tent of meeting. Again, this is the bird's eye view. Why am I drawing off this? Well, I, mean, I want to get rid of, I want to get rid of the basin here because I want to show you something really neat that happens in Exodus 34 and connected to Exodus 33, showing us that God wanted all of humanity to enter into his true presence, to enter into God's own dwelling, which is God's own home, eternal life, God himself. So go back to Exodus 34, and it says, it says, after he came down, so they were afraid, light shining out of Moses. They're afraid to come near him. He calls them back. He gives them all the additional commandments God has given. And it says, verse 34. So chapter 34 of Exodus, verse 34. Whenever Moses went in before the Lord to speak with him, he took the veil off. So in other words, when he'd be done speaking with the people, he'd have to put on a veil because they'd be afraid of him because he was radiating God's, God's life and light. And so he did that to keep them from being scared. So whenever Moses went in before the Lord to speak with him, he took the veil off until he came out. And when he came out and told the sons of Israel what he was commanded, the sons of Israel saw the face of Moses, that the skin of Moses' face shone, and Moses would put the veil upon his face again until he went in to speak with him. What are they talking about when they say, whenever Moses went in before the Lord to speak with him, he took the veil off, and then light would come out of him, and then he, and then he covered again. What's it speaking of? It's speaking of this. At the golden calf, all of Israel was involved, even Aaron. But because the Levites joined up to fix the situation and correct it, to live up to the covenant that they had made, God decided the Levite that had belonged to everybody and was open to everybody was going to go only to the Levites. So when the glory cloud that was on Mount Sinai when Moses constructed the tent of meeting, according to the speeches that you find in chapters 25 through 31 of Exodus, when the tent of meeting is made, the glory cloud that was on Mount Sinai, we read in Exodus 40, it came down on the tent of meeting and filled it, showing the tent of meeting had become a traveling Mount Sinai. And I highly recommend reading and looking at some of the charts in Bergman Petrie, page 183 and 187, in the discussion of, of the setup of the tent. So what Moses is going into whenever he enters the tent of meeting is what's being discussed in Exodus 34. When it says, whenever Moses, Exodus 34, 34, whenever Moses went in before the Lord to speak with him, it's talking about him going into this tent of meeting, which is the tabernacle. And we have something very interesting that shows us Eden means wherever someone can enter into the true presence of the Lord, there is Eden. So in other words, while all the non-Levites were kicked out of permission from not only entering the Lord's holy mountain, but the tent of meeting, which now represented the Lord's holy mountain, Moses was never involved in the sin, so Moses could enter whenever he wanted. In other words, Moses was able to go in and out of what represents Eden. That's what that tent tabernacle represents. And we can see that's what it represents when we read Exodus chapter 33. The scriptures sometimes are moving in a progressive but also circular movement. It begins, and it tells a story, and it comes back, and it, and it tells a story, and it comes back, and it tells a story, and it comes back. And so it's presuming, in some degree, you already know the story of Exodus. It's now in its written version. And it's presuming when you're reading Exodus 33, it's presuming in advance 
that the tent of meeting was already set up. There's actually, I'm using the RSV right now, but there's a really good footnote in the New American Bible about it, that you see the tent is already set up in the discussion that's happening in Exodus chapter 33. And so it says that Moses, chapter 33, verse 7, uh, actually start at verse 8. Whenever Moses went out to the tent, all the people rose up, and every man stood at his tent door and looked after Moses until he had gone into the tent. When Moses entered the tent, when Moses entered the tent, the pillar of cloud would descend and stand at the door of the tent, and the Lord would speak with Moses. So I want to draw here the pillar of cloud standing at the tent of meeting. And I want to, I want to go through the story with you and ask you, what is the pillar of cloud? Go if you would, because Exodus presumes you know what the pillar of cloud was. Exodus chapter 14, verse 19. We meet the pillar of cloud that is leading them out of Egypt. By daytime, it's a pillar of cloud, also causing cloud and shade above them. And what's it look like at nighttime? I see you all with your mics, tur your mics are turned off. Anyone want to hop in here? What did the pillar of cloud look like at nighttime? Ray, you got, you got an attentive look there? Yeah, a column of fire. A column of fire. So it's a pillar of cloud, so it's almost circling as a pillar, a pillar of cloud. And, and at nighttime, it's a pillar of fire. And a lot of times, you know, that's what the cloud that came down on Mount Sinai looked like, a storm cloud, so full of lightning, it looked like it was on fire. And so uh, a pillar of cloud died by day, a pillar of fire by night. But we get in Exodus chapter 14, this pillar of cloud that's leading them out of Egypt to cross the Red Sea, this is the point where Pharaoh's armies are coming behind them to kill them. And the pillar of cloud that was leading them is going to go behind them to stand between them and the armies of Pharaoh until the wind finishes drying out the pathway through the Red Sea while the Red Sea splits with walls of water to the left and to the right. And listen to what it says about this. It says in verse 19 of chapter 14, then the angel of God who went before the host of Israel moved and went behind them. And the pillar of cloud moved from before them and stood behind them. These are parallelisms. This is just repeating in the second line an explanation of what happened in the first line. In other words, the angel of God who went behind them is the pillar of cloud. And you have to remember the pillar of cloud looks like a pillar of fire at night. Now then, flip, if you would, to Genesis chapter 3, verse 24. What I want to point to is this. Since the temple, the tent temple is actually representative of Eden, because looking at Eden from a bird's eye view, we also see that the bird's eye, the, the bird's eye view that we have from Eden actually is the bird's eye view of Mount Sinai. Mount Sinai is representative of heaven and earth being joined and causing a sanctuary of the Lord that's full of life. How did Moses look like when he came out of the cloud on top of Mount Sinai, full of God's own life, clothed in glory? Why was Adam and Eve, why were they naked but not ashamed? Because in contemplating the Lord and preparing through contemplation, they're taking on the Lord's glory because the Lord is sharing through his spirit his own life with Adam and Eve, who always knew life inside God's will, representative of being able to go and be in the garden, in the holy place. When Moses is going into the tent of meeting, it says the pillar of cloud comes down and stands at the doorway. What is the pillar of cloud? Susan, you look ready to go. The angel. The angel. Okay. So in other words, it is a at nighttime, that angel would be a swirling or spinning fire of some kind. Now look back at this middle chart I have here for Genesis chapter 3, 24. When Adam and Eve are kicked out of the Garden of Eden, it means, it means basically just like Israel is told they cannot enter, only the Levites can enter God's temple, and the people 
The people of Israel at Mount Sinai are stripped of their priesthood. They lose their priesthood, represented by the garments of priesthood being stripped away. Adam and Eve are kicked out of the Garden in Eden, uh, of Eden, and what stands at the doorway, and it says in Genesis chapter 3, verse 24, he drove out the man, and at the east of the Garden of Eden, he placed the cherubim and a flaming sword, which turned every way. Kind of like, I suppose, a spinning rotation. A flaming sword was turned every way to guard the way to the tree of life. So you notice there's bits of parallels here that it's at Mount Sinai, which is then replicated in the tent of meeting, that all of Israel, which was originally supposed to have access to entering the true presence of God, is kicked out of access to the true presence of God. They're stripped of the priesthood, and it belongs only to the Levites. And so we see Adam and Eve, it says, if you take a look, verse 20 of Genesis chapter 3, the man called his wife's name Eve. You notice there's a name change, which is very important. That means that there's a new mission. Something has been altered. Whenever there's a name change, something has been altered, and God is fitting someone for a new mission. Because she was the mother of all the living. And the Lord God made for Adam and for his wife garments of skins and clothed them. So when they're kicked out of the garden, what in fact are they losing? Well, remember, Adam and Eve came to life in the image and likeness of God. What does it mean to be in the image and likeness of God? Flip to Psalm 104. Psalm 104 says, verse 1, Bless the Lord, O my soul. O Lord, my God, you are very great. You are clothed with honor and majesty who cover yourself with light as with a garment. How were Adam and Eve clothed before sin? They were clothed like Moses. Moses is showing us what mankind was meant to be clothed in. He was meant to be clothed in the image and likeness of God. He was meant to be clothed in God and live off of God's own life by God's will being received into man and taking man's will into God's will so that man's will could live off of God's will and the two could become one. That was the whole meaning in the first place of the seven days of creation. God makes man the last of all on the sixth day in the image and likeness of God. And then the seventh day, the number seven, of course, from Shiva means oath. It meant God was swearing himself and all that he is and all that he possesses to the one in his image and likeness. And he was waiting there on the seventh day. God rested. Why? Because just like Moses entering into the glory cloud, which is representative of where heaven and earth are joined the true presence, God was waiting for Adam and Eve to eventually to be ready to commune with him and enter his rest and enter into more permanently what he wanted to give them. But before they could do it, sin which is exactly what happens with Moses at Mount Sinai. So Moses at Mount Sinai, they were going to have access to the glory they saw in Moses, but instead they sinned and they are stripped of what was originally promised that they would possess. And then we notice in order to even get back into the Garden of Eden, which is represented by the temple, God has to dress them. You'll notice Garments of skins were mentioned as what God dressed Adam and Eve with for their new mission. They weren't going to be granted access anytime soon back into God's dwelling place. Israel's picking back up where Adam and Eve left off, being invited back into God's home. And God's home is his divinity, eternal life, because that's what God is. And he was going to clothe us with his home. And so Take a look at, uh, if we could, um, is speaking of here. And so this is the last third of paragraph eight that we've been looking at. That, that first slide he was on was talking about how God gave us free will to consolidate, to choose God, and to choose to live in God's will be, by God's offer, by God's grace, by God and calling us by his goodness. 
We are free and we have to freely give ourselves and, and receive it into us. We have to receive it and hold on to it with our will to love God with all of our heart, all of our mind, all of our strength, and all of our soul, so that we put God first. And in doing this, God enters and infuses his life into us, clothing us with his divinity in the very essence of our soul and in the very faculties that belong to the soul, clothing us fully. And then the next paragraph was St. Gregory Nazianzen reminding us God, he was reminding us God never wanted to forbid the tree of the knowledge of good and evil to us. We just weren't ready yet, because why? It's about passing through from enlightenment to union, passing through the veil and, and, and receiving this union for which God had made mankind and something they would have somehow been able to transmit as well to their descendants through physical birth. But then it closes and St. Gregory Nazan gives us this ending to paragraph eight. He says, um, speaking in Adam's terms, alas for my weakness, for that of my first father was mine. So Gregory Nazianzen is, again, talking as being a descendant of Adam. Adam forgot the commandment which had been given him and yielded to the baleful fruit. And for his sin was banished at once from the tree of life and from paradise and from God, the true presence, and put on the coats of skins that is perhaps the coarser flesh, both mortal and and contradictory. And this was the first thing which he learned, his own shame, and he hid himself from God. In other words, instead of, you know, is man meant to be like God? Yes, God is meant to be, uh, man is meant to be like God. Remember, he made man, man was made in the image and likeness of God. The likeness to God is meant to increase. That's a reference to grace, increasing in our soul, sanctifying grace, the likeness. We're meant to grow in this likeness and enter more fully what is the mystery of God's word, the logos, the eternal son. And so Adam and Eve, instead of receiving God's word and receiving God's life, went outside the bounds and tried to take it for themselves, becoming a thief, misled by the wickedness of the devil. And so the very motion, what is God? God is gift of self. God is love. God is giving, life-giving and affirming, truthful. And Adam and Eve, invited into this, took a different motion. Untruthfulness, untrust, not putting God first, but putting human first. And so they became unlike God. So in their effort to become more like God, doing it their way instead of God's way, they became unlike God and more like the animals, That's actually what the tradition is when it says God clothed them in garments of skins. It doesn't mean he made them nice leather jackets and gave them a motorcycle. What it's saying is there was a change from their state of glory to being clothed in death. If you're wearing animal skins, which perhaps it could mean that, then it means you're clothed in death, telling you that even though you don't see it right now, you're going to become like the animals you're wearing. You're clothed in death. But the coarser flesh Gregory Nazianzen is representing is saying that God let our nature get hardened and coarse, more like the animals, so we could survive the harsher reality of the environment of the world. And through these new skins we were wearing, because garments of skins you see, for instance, you'll see in the book of Job that it'll refer to, Lord God, you clothed me in garments of skins, referring to when the Psalms say things like, I knit you in your mother's womb. Well, what did you knit me with, Lord? I knit you with the humanity you wear. So when it says God clothed them in garments of skins, it's talking about a new condition for Adam and Eve, and that's why they get a name change. They go from being called the man and the woman to now the man is a proper name, Adam. And mother of the living becomes Eve because now she's been fit for childbearing. So similarly, on the return back into Eden, those who had been unclothed in shame must cover the shame. And that's why you'll find, for instance, take a look. If you're going to enter back into the sanctuary, God gives instructions on how you must be clothed. Take a look at Exodus chapter 28, when dressing priests. And at this point, it wasn't only limited to the Levites, but Aaron's sons are being mentioned in Exodus. And he says, In verse 2 of chapter 28 of Exodus, 
You shall make holy garments for Aaron, your brother, for glory and for beauty. Go back to Psalm 104. How is God clothed in glory and beauty? How is God's image and likeness before sin clothed? Like high priests in beauty and glory. What did they look like after sin, stripped of beauty and glory, and now clothed in dead flesh or dying flesh? So if you're going to go back into Eden to exercise a priesthood, this is where God now does what? He starts clothing the people who are called to go through ritual purifications, to surrender their will, to contemplate sacraments, not sacraments as we know them today in the Catholic Church, but signs and prefigurements of what's to come. And so notice what they wear, for instance, verse 36 of chapter 28. You shall make a plate of pure gold and engrave on it like the engraving of a signet, holy to the Lord. So a gold plate they wore on a turban on their forehead, gold. In other words, it's kind of like the shining of light out of one's face is what the gold represents, being clothed in God's name. Just like when you're baptized, you receive again the name of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit as your head goes under the water or you are poured or sprinkled, however baptism was done, as long as you said, I baptize, <laughs> at least for the, uh, the, the certain controversies that come up in the Western liturgies. Uh, notice God is clothing them before they can enter the Holy of Holies again, before they can enter the tent of meeting. So what's interesting uh, really, when you look at all this, go back to what was our point in this? We're trying to show that we were made to enter God's rest, which really is his divinity. We were made to become partakers of the divine nature. Listen to how God later on describes the rest that he wanted us to have. Go to Psalm 95. Psalm 95, verse 8. He says, Harden not your hearts as at Meribah, as on the day of Massa in the wilderness, when your fathers tested me and put me to the proof, though they had seen my work. So he's referring to the Exodus and bringing them out of Egypt to Mount Sinai and then to the borders of the Holy Land. For 40 years, I was wearied of that generation and said, there are people who err in heart and they do not regard my ways. They don't take on my likeness. Therefore, I swore in my anger that they should not enter my rest. Well, what's that mean? It means two things. It's certainly a reference to getting into the land of Israel is resting. But what did the land of Israel represent? It represented a place where you had to keep God's law to stay inside of it. It represented a place where you had to surrender your will to God and put God first in all things if you wanted to stay in the land and not get kicked out again. In other words, it represented a holy land. And analogously, it's telling us exactly what the tent of meeting represented. Without your will being taken into God's will by God's power, and by you saying yes to the grace being poured into you, asking you to give your will, you cannot enter into God's rest. You cannot enter it without God's covenant, which was broken which Jesus Christ is going to come to restore. The future covenant in which God describes rest again in Hosea. Turn to Hosea chapter 2. We learn how to interpret Genesis chapter 1 through 3 as really being God's attempt to spiritually give us a mystical marriage a mystical union with himself through the seven days of creation. He's swearing an oath to us. And then he's asking us to enter into his oath by surrendering our will to his giving himself to us. And that's what the tree of the knowledge of good and evil represents, where we surrender our will to God and accept God's word and trust in God to take us through the rest of the way for God to lead us forward into life in him. Because it's not something we get to take. It's something we receive as a pure gift, a gift that God made us for. And so he says in Hosea chapter 2, he says he is going to remove all the idolatry from us. And he says in verse 18, chapter 2, verse 18, I will make for you a covenant on that day with the beasts of the field, the birds of the air, 
and the creeping things of the ground. He's moving through the days of creation. And then he says, and I will abolish the bow, the sword and war from the land. I will make you lie down in safety. If you're lying down in safety, what are you doing? What do you think, Rosemary? Resting. 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 And so in other words, you're entering God's rest. How? Through his covenant. I will espouse you forever. Verse 19. In other words, what was God doing in Genesis chapter 7? Resting. He was trying to espouse us. What was he always trying to do? Spiritually espouse us. I will espouse you in righteousness and in justice and in steadfast love and in mercy. I will espouse you in faithfulness and you shall know the Lord. In other words, I'm going to give you my grace to make you faithful. I'm going to give you a new covenant. And this is Jesus Christ who brings us back into God's rest. He is the true tent. John chapter 1, verse 14. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us. But the Greek word is actually, I'm trying to write the Greek, it's like skenane. It actually means he pitched his tent. This tent, in other words, the flesh of Jesus is the new tent because inside the tent is the fullness of divinity. And so you got to remember, all Israel was kept out of the tent, except the high priest could enter once a year into the Holy of Holies with the blood of bulls. Once a year, he could enter the Holy of Holies. We Christians who belong to Jesus, the true high priest, through his body and blood, which are the body and blood of God, and giving us his body and blood, he's taking us behind the new veil into the very divinity of God, and we're resting on the Sabbath. Jesus is the Sabbath. We're resting in him in holy communion. He's going to restore to us and bring us back into what all of Eden, Mount Sinai, and all these other things prefigured. I mentioned I was going to go into a little bit of examining the serpent. So what I have here is a vignette or planche from uh, Jean-Francois Champollion. And of course, he is the archaeologist. He is the uh, discoverer of the Rosetta Stone. So that which enabled us to translate ancient Egyptian. So back in uh, the 1800s, um, when Egyptology is really getting going, he found in Memphis, this is where, of course, the Exodus takes place from, he found this planche. I wanted to show you there's a real connection, not just in how Mount Sinai is represented in a bird's eye view, that, that it's Genesis, uh, it's Eden, Mount Sinai is Eden. I wanted to tell you, in fact, I want to have a chance to go into, in fact, the Apis bull that they worship the golden calf is really a copy of what is basically an Apis bull. And so what you're seeing in Exodus chapter 32 with the golden calf is a representation of this Apis bull, which is a representation of Ptah. He is the embodiment of the creator God. And notice there's a serpent right in front of the Apis bull. The Apis bull is what the golden calf would have been modeled after. And notice that now, now on the serpent's head, I can't see it here because all the pictures are in front of it. There's a serpent, and notice what a serpent is wearing on his head. He's wearing what's called a hedget. And this represents his control over the upper Nile and the lower Nile. And so you have a serpent wearing a pharaoh's headdress. And what's unique about Memphis... Um, ancient Egyptology, is that the serpent is, is Tefnut in Memphis. The Uraeus serpent uh, that you're seeing there. Let me go back and say this. You see a serpent, the Uraeus serpent, wearing a pharaoh's headdress. What's a pharaoh wear? Susan, what's a pharaoh wear on his head? The, he wears on his head, basically he's made to look like a cobra, with his headdress, and coming out of his forehead is that very serpent. And so I wanted to say that the idolatry that you see in Exodus chapters 32 with the Apis bull, the idolatry that you see taking place with worshiping is a kind of Pharaoh worship. It's a return to recognizing the religion of Pharaoh. But the Uraeus, and, and of course, Pharaoh, a Pharaoh embodies the serpent. So it's very interesting. You meet an Apis bull 
in Exodus chapter 32, uh, which, which is idolatry, which, which breaks on the human side, it breaks covenant with God. God remains faithful. But notice what they meet in Genesis chapter 3 when we're dealing with Eden. It's a serpent doing all the speaking because an ancient Memphis cosmogony, the serpent is the tongue of the Egyptian creator God and would therefore represent trying to take Adam and Eve into an idolatry that you see reflected similarly in Exodus chapter 32. I would argue the serpent, because we have to enter into Moses' mindset and the culture of Moses and the people of the Exodus, they would have right away caught that the serpent represents the false religion of Pharaoh. And that's why I think about it, how many walking, talking serpents because since the, the punishment for the sin was a serpent had to crawl on his belly, which meant before that time you were standing upright, how many upright, walking, talking serpents would you think of back in Moses' time? The only upright, walking, talking serpent that brings you into idolatry is a pharaoh. So it has a symbolism of the false religion of Egypt and Canaan. And we'll, we'll open up the rest of this up to, to questions. Fantastic. Thank you, Doctor. I'd like to give an opportunity to anybody on screen if you have a question. Uh, yeah, Carl, go ahead. Psalms 104, also at the end, when you're talking about how God is clothed in light, it also brings in the messengers of God, the angels, as messengers of fire. So that goes again with the pillar of fire and Exodus, Eden, outside paradise. So it seems like the angels and this fiery angels and cherubim are always around the presence of God and protecting the presence of God. And that's why we have to enter properly into God's presence because of the angels, which then gets us into other Paulian theology about angels and women's headdress and how we should enter into God's presence. So I thought that was interesting. As I was reading, I'm like, oh, we didn't bring that up. Here's a question. This question, uh, it has to do with connecting some of these concepts into the New Testament. Um, so Kathy, this time around, is asking, in the gospel parable about the king who threw the banquet where no one showed and then invited those off the streets, someone showed up not wearing a wedding garment. Yeah. Is this wedding garment talking about being clothed in beauty and glory? What's the connection here? Uh, certainly the wedding garment is being clothed in Christ, so baptized. Um only the baptized can receive Jesus Christ in Holy Communion. And since the very banquet is God, God's giving us himself to consume and share his divinity in our soul, we have to desire it. And so we have to eat God not only with our mouth, the, the, the body and blood of Christ, which is incapable of being destroyed because it's divine, it's divinity. We not only must eat God in Holy Communion with our mouth, we must eat him with our will. We must desire to be filled. Uh, and so we have to pray for the grace of God to give us a greater desire for him and to receive him because God wants to fill us, but he only fills us in so far as we've let him move us to desire him more. And so to show up without wearing the white garments uh, or, or, or dressed is meaning in, in order to receive the banquet is God, union with God, who is our true spouse, the one who's trying to espouse us and give us true rest. So that's certainly the, the ultimately what Jesus is pointing to in that parable. And that's actually what, that's why the book of Revelation ends with that great wedding feast. It's actually a very liturgical book that the, the book of Revelation is trying to show us the mystery of the lamb who was slain, who takes us but while on earth by consuming his body and blood, we're being taken to where he is at. Just like in John 14, he says, I go away, but I do not leave you orphans. I will return to you. I go to prepare a place for you. This is the great mystery of what is being accomplished as a foretaste in Holy Communion, the reality of participation in the divine nature, building that we will share in God after, we're sharing in God now, but that we'll find ourselves with God after death. And so Holy Communion is pulling us in building heaven into us right now. Heaven and earth are joined in our souls. Thank you, doctor. I see Ahmed has a question here on screen. Go ahead and unmute yourself. My question is, how does, I guess, sorry, 
when he met his disciples on the way to Emmaus, how does that connect to this story? You know, like they didn't recognize him. That's sort of like a veil before yeah. he broke the bread. It's very much like, what are the new veil? I'll turn if you would. Um, and I think this really shows us what's being said here. The new veil is the bread and wine that look like bread and wine, but have become the body and blood of Jesus hiding what, you know, the great mystery. So mystery, mysterion being translated into sacrament, that which communicates participation. And so you find the, the, the veiling, in other words, the mystery is veiled, but we also know the mystery through the veil. And so you find actually in Hebrews chapter 12, you can see where a connection is made right here to Holy Communion. So we're told, uh, keep one finger there in Hebrews chapter 12, and look at Hebrews chapter 10. It says, Hebrews chapter 10, verses 1 through 15 is telling us, Jesus, God took a body in order to have a human will, so that a human will would be totally in the divine will. Jesus has two wills, a human will and a divine will. His human will is always in the divine will, in full union. And so um, his flesh is the new veil. And so it says in chapter 10, verse 19, but he says, Brethren, since we have confidence to enter the sanctuary by the blood of Jesus, by the new and living way which he opened for us through the curtain, the veil represented by the, the cloud represented by the curtain, the way he opened it is through his flesh, through his death and resurrection. And so at Holy Communion, it says basically what's being inferred here in, in Hebrews chapter 12, verse 18. When you're approaching Holy Communion, you're approaching something greater than that storm cloud full of lightning that it looked like a cloud of fire on top of Mount Sinai. You're, you're, you're approaching actually not something caused by the activity of angels. You're actually, and that's, that's what St. Augustine and St. Paul are saying that formed the cloud was the activity of the angels, God coming riding on the activity of the angels. He's saying in Hebrews chapter 12, verse 18, for you have not come to what may be touched a blazing fire and darkness and gloom and a tempest and the sound of a trumpet and a voice whose words made the hearers entreat that no further message be spoken to them. For they could not endure the order that was given. If even a beast touches the mountain, it shall be stoned. Indeed, so terrifying was the sight that Moses said, I tremble with fear. But you have come to Mount Zion. Well, that connects with Revelation chapter 14, the lamb standing on Mount Zion. The true mountain of the Lord, the true temple of the Lord is the risen body of Jesus. You have come to Mount Zion, to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem. That's what's happening in Hebrews chapter 10, verses 19 through 20 and on. That's Holy Communion. You've come to angels and fester gathering, to the assembly of the firstborn who are enrolled in heaven, to a judge who is God, to the spirits of just men, and to Jesus, the mediator of a new covenant. That's exactly chapters 20 and 21, the lamb in the city of God. You can go in of it. You can go, just like Adam and Eve, you go in and out of Eden. It wasn't until the cherubim is placed there, like the pillar of cloud, that they couldn't go in and out. They were kicked out forever. You and I are readmitted. We've received the sonship. We've become sons in the son. Israel lost its sonship when it was stripped of the priesthood. It lost entrance into God's home, being sons. And ever since Leviticus and the sin in Numbers, they're being treated like a slave instead of a son, even though the original call is still to make them sons, to make humanity sons. So we're actually entering God himself, the true Holy of Holies, when we receive the body and blood of Jesus, which is the body and blood of God. I'm sorry, and then Susan, Ray, and then Susan. I have a question. You explained uh, the animal skins in a way I had never heard before. Also, I was wondering, is it not also a hint of the shedding of blood cover our nakedness and our coarseness? There's a few ways to approach the garments of skins. This is the article that's going to be sent to you as well, because the garments of skins may well be representing a new condition, but they're also representing a new way of doing service. The way God dresses us means God is assigning us a service. So he's certainly assigning Adam and Eve through all of this to be fruitful and multiply. And that through having children, 
they will be working out their salvation, which is kind of what's also said in the Catholic epistles as well. But you do notice, yes, animals are, are having to, to die in a prefiguring way to cover our sin. I think you could certainly say that, blood covering it. But most importantly, the, the shedding of blood is the representing of giving that which is most dear to you. So all these sacrifices ultimately representing, um, you know, Isaac representing what was most dear to Abraham was Isaac. And that Isaac was, and Abraham was willing to give what was most dear to him as he's stuck in Amorite culture, and everyone does this in Amorite culture. But ultimately, since Abraham was willing to give his all back to God, and we're told you can't outdo God. So therefore, God must now give his son to us. So when Jesus sheds his blood, it's very clear in Hebrews chapter 10 is what I'm coming to. It's very clear that he took a body in order to bring the human will through human experiences. It's already in the fullness of God because Jesus is God. And so it, it, it is the, the very divine being of God as proceeding from the Father, the Logos, is what has taken a human heart. And so part of the mystery that we see is where every other person in human nature would want to shy away from death, Christ's will is pushed to having to, I mean, how much more can you give of your human will than total suffering and death? In other words, in, no, he couldn't have given more, and in his true knowledge and total knowledge and holiness, suffered more because of that. And so the blood is the only way through which a human can really give his all. And that's why the blood is so life-giving and the threat to all that's demonic, because it represents living totally for God and, and doing what God does. From all eternity, God gives himself to God, the Father to the Son, the Son to the Father in the Spirit. And we, as the image and likeness of God, must also totally give ourselves to God, as God has always done. In order to fulfill being the likeness, we must put God first to, to be the true gift in a created fashion of returning ourselves to God and putting God first. And the blood of Christ represents totally the absolute gift of the created order in Christ back to God. As manifested in the divine liturgy, the holy sacrifice of the Mass, which is why it's so life-giving and freeing from all sin. I've got a bunch of questions uh, that came in, uh, and they're all basically asking what the relationship is between the serpent in Eden and the bronze serpent who saves the people and the serpents that the Israelites have to contend with in the desert. Oh, okay. So it's not all necessarily the same level of signage, but I would certainly say this. You, you've got to remember two things that are going on. Uh, when Moses throws down his staff, remember it turns into a serpent? And so uh, then the sorcerers throw down their staff, and you see that Moses' serpent, which means he's speaking for the God, the true God. That's what that serpent would represent uh, when he throws it down. He, he is speaking for the one true God, and they would have understood that in Egypt. So in other words, the one true God serpent swallows the false God serpents. In other words, what is a serpent? It represents also death. When you read 1 Corinthians chapter 15, it uses this very imagery, and it says, verse 54 of chapter 15, when the perishable puts on the imperishable and the mortal puts on immortality, then shall come to pass the saying that is written, death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is your victory? The sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law, but thanks to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. So in other words, Jesus... In a sense, that serpent represents Jesus in this. That serpent was biting people, and that serpent, who is a sign of death, is actually restoring them to life. So the sign of Jesus' crucifixion is the sign of death. But Jesus is the Word of God, and he goes, he becomes death in dying. He enters into, I should say rather, he enters into death. And like the serpent, he swallows death. It doesn't swallow him. And so Christ is the one who, in the sign of his crucifixion, of which the bronze serpent is the prefigurement, 
That side of the crucifixion is that through death, death is destroyed because death tried swallowing the eternal life and nothing can swallow the eternal life. Therefore, eternal life burst the bonds of death and gave us the new humanity that Jesus has become for us according to 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 45, the last Adam. There's a new Adam we can all be born of, Jesus, the last Adam. And so he is, through his crucifixion, the crucifix itself is a sign that death has been swallowed by death. And that's kind of the symbolism that's happening with the uh, bronze serpent out there with Moses and why Jesus pointed to it. Uh, we had another bunch of questions come in. You mentioned briefly um, that after after the fall and being clothed with garments of skins, uh, that then Eve was fit for childbearing. Was fi- Eve not fit for childbearing before the fall? Well, it's not tr- It's not clear. It's not clear. So this is in the article a little bit. So there's some rabbinical references and the rest. I'm more pointing to a model that uh, certainly we're told to be fruitful and multiply, and God knew... Uh, God knew eventually the various ways that it would happen and the kind of way that humans were going to be born into the covenant or born outside the covenant. And of course, the garments of skins are representative of being born outside the covenant. So she's fitted for life, just like the garments of skin represent an amendment to the original um, covenant with creation. So Leviticus represents an amendment to Exodus chapter 19, verses 5 and 6. And so what, what I'd be saying is there's a pattern that gets discussed in the article, uh, in the Creator article. You'll notice Adam and Eve don't have children yet. And it's not until, well, I should actually, we should actually be correct in saying, you'll notice in the RSV, you notice Adam is not called with a capital A, Adam, until Genesis 3, 17, after the sin. Up until that time, based on the on the whether or not there's a Hebrew article in front of Adam, uh, they're calling Adam the man, the man and the woman, the man and the woman. It's very generic because it's a prehistory. And then as we enter into the history of sin, it is Adam, and then Adam acting as God's spokesman. Here, Adam um, calls her Eve. And so you see both of them with a change to their nature, garments of skins and a change to their name, and given a mission, and now they're having children. You're going to see that matches what happens with Abram, father, uh, exalted father, and Sarai, princess. It's only after God alters Abram with circumcision and changes their name, which means a change of nature, Back then, a neophyte means new nature. You receive a new nature. So God is giving them, in a sense, a new nature. And it's only after that happens, just like with the man and the woman. Now you have another man and woman. And it's not until the name change that they start having the children, that it's something God has joined. So I'm just saying there's a lot of symbolic, ancient understanding in terms of name changes, and alteration of nature, which is presupposed in the early patristic tradition of the garments of skins is representing, as Gregory Nazianzen calls it, the coarser flesh. And as Augustine says in his De Trinitate, that he quotes the Psalms and says, instead of becoming more like the angels, I think he might have said the angels, they became more like the animals. And, of course, St. Lawrence of Brindisi says the same thing, doctor of the church. So, in other words, you see figures of this uh, just like the king of Babylon, when all of a sudden he sins and tries to exalt himself. He's clothed in coarse flesh and and his long nails, and it's not until he repents that he's restored to less coarse flesh. This is all prefigurements of the change of nature with the change of names with Adam and Eve. You don't have to go that way. Gregory Nazianza doesn't say you have to interpret it that way, but you can see there is a strong tradition that establishes um, we're seeing main changes which represent a change to the nature, particularly with the removal of garments of skins with circumcision. Thank you. I think we'll take two more questions here. So the penultimate question uh, comes from Mike. He asks, uh, is Mount Sinai still a holy place today? And if not, why not? 
It certainly is. Um, I have no doubt. I, I'm not a historian or archaeologist in this, in this area, but Mount Sinai does have on top of it what every, what every holy place uh, like this should, and that is it has a, a monastery on the very top, uh, uh, the Monastery of St. Catherine. And so it has a religious order caring for Mount Sinai. I don't know what the history is or what things may have changed, but certainly it was always kept as a holy mountain. We know the holiness of that mountain, though, transferred to Jerusalem because the Tent of Meeting, and this is what Father Sabatino is going to be uh, working with you all on in Joshua, they're trying to transfer what happened at Mount Sinai through the Tent of Meeting, bringing the Ark to Jerusalem. And so what was Mount Sinai is truly transferred to Jerusalem, and what belonged to Jerusalem from the time of David to the time of Christ is then transferred to Jesus Christ, and we climb that mountain every time we receive Holy Communion, Mount Zion. And I suppose that the the transfer, I mean, among the many signs, one of them would be like the tearing of the temple veil then, right? Bursting forth and yes. going from the temple over to Calvary. But we still recognize the holiness of these places. So, for instance, where the Ark of the Covenant went, there's special shrines to the Ark of the Covenant because they didn't get to Jerusalem right away. It took 400 years once they entered the Promised Land before it made its way to Jerusalem. But you'll notice the Virgin Mary, who's the true Ark of the Covenant, you know, the Ark of the Covenant with Moses carried the Word of God in stone. The Virgin Mary carries the Word of God in flesh in her womb. So she's the true Ark of the Covenant. Wherever the Virgin Mary appears and the church acknowledges her appearances, we build a shrine. It's a holy place because heaven touched earth there with the, with the, with the Virgin Mary joining the, the body of her son to help us in our struggles here in this Valley of Tears. So that's why we build chapels and cathedrals and basilicas where the Virgin Mary's appears. All right, we'll end with this question then. So Catherine asks, why did God allow sin to happen in the first place? Why even allowed the serpent to be present in the Garden of Eden? I think what we have to recognize is, is the very question of freedom itself. So though freedom exists for us to choose the good so that we can develop in the good, I mean, that's the very point that was trying to be made in St. Gregory Nazianzen's oration, second oration on Easter. And I, I'm guessing this is somewhere around 380 AD that he gave this. And he says that um, this being he placed in paradise, whatever that paradise may have been, having honored him with the gift of free will in order that good might belong to him as the result of his choice. So in other words, freedom exists in order for us through knowledge to to be led by God to see the true good and for our will to cling to it. And so we have to be free to decide whether or not we're going to keep God first in our life. Otherwise, we can't consolidate that goodness within ourselves. It has to, God made us free beings in his image and likeness. And so that means we have to use our mind and our heart to truly choose God. It's something where if you want to live in God, that it's something that doesn't happen just by accident. And so this is where freedom is designed to, con freedom exists for consolidating a share in God, ultimately, to be led. And, and so it's a matter of putting God first. So without freedom, we can't organize our lives in a way that put God first. But that also means having freedom, we can also turn away from putting God first in our lives. But if God didn't give us the freedom, then we would never be the creature who grows and develops through freedom, and therefore are true persons, because God is ultimate persons. We can only be in that image and likeness insofar as we freely give ourselves to God. And so since love is not something that can be forced, in other words, God wants us to love him in return because he is our true good. If he didn't give us freedom, we couldn't really love him in a manner in which we're giving ourselves to him. And since love is the most important thing, he wants us to do it with freedom. But freedom means the freedom to say no. But that's a lesson. In other words, our freedom exists to say yes to God. Only secondarily do we have the power to say no in order to say no to things that keep us 
from giving ourselves first to God. And so loving in spirit and in truth. But God, according to Ephesians chapter 1, made us before the foundation of the world. He chose us in Christ before the foundation of the world. So God was always, no matter if we misused our freedom, God was still going to accomplish his plan because his ways are high above our ways, and my word should not return to me void, as it says in Isaiah. So God is with us. Thank you. Thank you, Doctor, for uh, all of your generous, uh, well, your generous amount of time with us. And uh, we went a little long with Q&A here, but that's because so many wonderful questions came in. So thanks for sticking with us. Uh, Doctor, would you be able to close us in prayer? So let's pray in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Jesus, you loved us so much that you wanted to die to experience death with us. You loved us so much you gave your life for the world. You loved us so much that on the cross, you wanted us to have a true spiritual mother as you are the the true Adam, and, and you gave us the true Eve, the Virgin Mary. And so all of us, in humility, since you came into the world through her and have given her to us to be our mother, we say we accept her as our mother. We ask our mother Mary to put her mantle around us and make us belong more firmly to her, that we may belong more fully to Jesus Christ, you, Lord. And so, Lord, we ask you to bless us with every blessing that comes from you through the hands of the Virgin Mary. And for the Virgin Mary, for us to experience in our lives is more fully our mother and to lead us into a deeper union with you and your church. Amen. We hope you enjoyed this presentation from the Institute of Catholic Culture. If you'd like to learn more about the mission of the Institute and how you may become a part of this important work, please visit our website at www.instituteofcatholicculture.org or call us at 540-635-7155. And may the glory of Christ Church be ever more manifest upon the earth. St. John the Evangelist, pray for us.